One day, the sun will turn against us. Not in five billion years when it expands into a red giant, but in our own near future. A solar superflare, hundreds of times stronger than anything we've ever recorded, could arrive tomorrow. The kind that burns satellites out of the sky, shuts down every power grid on Earth, and blindsides civilization, sending us back centuries, rendering life nearly impossible. When that day comes, one question will matter more than any other. Where do we go when Earth itself can't protect us? Welcome. Today we're stepping into a story of survival, not in some distant galaxy, but just 384,000 kilometers away. This is the moon, humanity's first refuge when home is no longer safe. It starts as a faint ripple in the sun's light, barely detectable unless you're looking for it, a super flare. Not the small bursts we see every few years, but a monster the kind that burns its name into history. Astronomers run the math. The wave will slam into Earth in less than two weeks. Its radiation will scorch satellites, melt transformers, and fry the electric nervous system of our civilization. Water treatment plants, hospitals, every city unplugged. Imagine the lights go out and they never come back. Not for days, not for months, maybe not for years. Your fridge is a warm box. Your phone is a dead brick. Fresh water, you carry it in buckets, if you can find it. There's no way to shield the whole planet, but there is a way to save a fraction of us. And so, for the first time in history, Earth prepares for a human evacuation. Not to another country, but to another world. The moon becomes the target, not because it's perfect, but because it's possible. It's close, 384,000 kilometers away. You can reach it in three days with the right rocket. It has water ice hidden in shadowed craters, a gift more valuable than gold. NASA's Artemis program is already planting the first footprints, mapping ice, testing habitats, and turning the moon from a destination into a doorway. Evacuation rosters fill fast. Not everyone can go, not even close. Governments pick scientists, engineers, doctors, pilots, the people they think can keep a civilization breathing. A few ordinary citizens are chosen by lottery. Millions apply. Only thousands make the list. Launch day is chaos. Crowds gather outside spaceports, not with banners, but with desperate pleas. The lucky few step onto shuttles with nothing but a small bag and a crushing knowledge. They are leaving almost everyone they've ever known behind. The rockets lift off, Earth falls away. The moon grows larger, from a silver coin in the sky to a scarred, endless horizon. The landing kicks up great clouds of lunar dust, so fine it clings to everything like ash. It smells faintly of burnt gunpowder, and once it gets into a habitat, it's a nightmare to clean. The first settlement isn't a sci-fi city. It's a handful of inflatable modules buried under two meters of regolith to block deadly cosmic rays. Inside, it's cramped. The air tastes recycled. The hum of life support systems is constant. Food is powdered rations, supplemented with early hydroponic gardens, rows of lettuce and potatoes under harsh LED lights. Every drop of water is recycled. Showers are a luxury measured in seconds. And the toilets? <laughs> Let's just say, if you thought airline bathrooms were bad, you haven't used a zero-privacy vacuum-sealed lunar latrine. Outside, every step is careful. The moon's gravity is one-sixth of Earth's. You don't walk, you bounce. A fall that would bruise you on Earth could send you sprawling into equipment worth more than your life. At night, the Earth hangs in the sky like a blue and white lantern. Colonists gather at the viewing port just to stare at it. Some cry. Others can't look for long. From the moon, it looks 
beautiful. The sun blooms, not with the slow drama of a sunset, but with the blinding violence of a star in rage. On Earth, the effects are immediate. Power grids overload, satellites blink out. The night side of the planet becomes a quilt of darkness. The colonists can't hear the chaos, but they can imagine it. They send messages to loved ones, knowing they may never get a reply. Some check their screens every hour. Others stop checking at all. It's a strange kind of survivor's guilt to be alive but unable to help. To know that your survival came at the cost of someone else's place on the ship. The moon was meant to be a backup. Now, it's humanity's primary home. Weeks turn into months. The gardens expand. Lettuce, beans, dwarf tomatoes. Water is mined from shadowed craters, melted, purified. 3D printers turn regolith into bricks, building new walls and tunnels. Children learn to walk in low gravity, their <laughs> laughter floating through the cramped corridors. Life here is not easy. You miss rain on your face. You miss the smell of forests. You miss the sound of waves. But you adapt. Humans always adapt. And slowly, the moon stops being the place we fled to and becomes home. One day, power returns to parts of Earth. The cities begin to glow again. Communication flickers back. Some colonists dream of returning. Others can't imagine leaving. Maybe the future of humanity won't be decided on Earth's surface at all. Maybe our survival depends on whether we dare to leave home before home leaves us. We realized humanity's story doesn't have to end where it began. That we can carry the memory of Earth into other worlds. That we can light new skies even when the old ones go dark. And when the sun flares again, we will not be trapped beneath it. We will be ready not because we conquered space, but because we dared to call it home. Thanks for watching. If you found this journey thought provoking, hit like, subscribe, and join me for more explorations of what lies ahead. And until next time, stay curious.